Mr. V is here to discuss uh, the watershed, the regulations, and give you kind of an, uh, a sense of what indeed may be possible uh, within the watershed and what, you know, the constraints that are there and, and the, uh, the standards that have to be, uh, that have to be met to ensure water quality as well as, uh, as well as the septic and, and stormwater uh, issues too. So it's, uh, it's really down and dirty stuff and there's only one guy who can do it and that's Philippines. So please, uh, please give a, a warm, uh, uh, warm Uh, two-thirds of Putnam, 
uh, a little bit of Duchess, and believe it or not, itsy bitsy pieces of Connecticut. Uh, so all of those areas drain to uh, the Croton reservoirs, which traditionally have provided drinking water, about 10% of the city's drinking water, to about 800,000 people. So we had a situation before Governor Pataki intervened where uh, New York City's water quality was threatened. The city faced the prospect of having to construct a mega filtration plant for the water that it was collecting in west of Hudson, in the Catskill and Delaware portions of the water supply. Uh, by the way, that plant, if it had to build it, that plant today, it would cost between 10 and 20 billion dollars. That's not million as in Austin Powers, that's billion. Uh, the price tag was lower then, but it was still fairly astronomical. Uh, filtration was generally required by the Federal State Drinking Water Act. And that act, uh, under that act, EPA promulgated what's called the Surface Water Treatment Rule, which says uh, if you have a fairly sizable public drinking water supply, obtaining water from surface waters, that, that means reservoirs, lakes, streams, what have you, uh, you've got to filter unless you obtain what's called a filtration avoidance determination or a waiver. So we had that situation going on. Uh, meanwhile, here in the east of Hudson area, because of all of the development, especially at a time when the environmental consciousness and laws were just not in place, uh, we had sewage treatment plants discharging within this watershed. Uh, which needed to be upgraded. Uh, we had stormwater pollution uh, because the infrastructure was created in a different era before people knew about the need to uh, reduce stormwater pollution to protect wetlands, to protect lakes and reservoirs and the like. And so the water had deteriorated so much in the Croton area, this east of Hudson portion, that uh, it was too late and they had to build a uh, filtration plant, that plant's just about complete right now. So this is where we were, and uh, there was litigation, disputes, especially among uh, folks west of Hudson, who had a pretty unfortunate history of, uh, I don't know if you call it colonialism, if we have colonialism in our own country or our own state, but the power of New York City was overriding in the early part of the 1900s, and they control, had a lot of control over uh, what went on in the state. And they obtained authority, all this extraterritorial authority over rural areas west of Hudson. And um, uh, so there, the people in those communities were concerned that New York City was over-regulated. And so they reached this pact, this memorandum of agreement to provide for a cooperative approach, which uh, would allow the city not to filter uh, the bulk of its water at tremendous expense, but instead it would issue sensible regulations to protect water quality. Uh, it would upgrade sewage treatment plants and pay for that. It would repair failing septic systems, and the city was paying for all of this or almost all of it. And the city also was purchasing land as buffers to pollution. Yeah. A tiny little bit of this MOA has to do with me. And that's the part that created this position of Watershed Inspector General. It's a joint appointment of the governor and the attorney general. I'm the second one in this job. I was <coughs> appointed uh, by Governor Spitzer and Attorney General Cuomo when they had those jobs. And um, the WIG operates, that's an acronym, W-I-G, I call my own hair, but <laughs> I am the WIG nonetheless, uh, within the Attorney General's office. And there are two aspects to the job. The first is more traditional enforcement investigatory function. Uh, we can 
can subpoena records and investigate uh, potential violations of law involving uh, the environment to protect this New York City watershed. Uh, we can prosecute cases civilly and criminally, and we can do that. And then the other path is more of a policy role, and that's really more where I get involved with what goes on in the development community here. And uh, by executive order of Governor Pataki, which was uh, endorsed and renewed by the subsequent governors, uh, Spitzer, Patterson, and Cuomo, uh, the position involves making recommendations, participating in comments and secret processes and the like uh, to protect the water. So uh, that's what we do. And um, I, I like to uh, think of this as being a kibitzer. You know, there's a new proposed development uh, which uh, may or may not have an impact or potential impact on water quality. And we submit comments. We have our own science staff. We have engineering expertise. In particular, we have a consultant named Don, Donald Lake, who is a leading expert on stormwater pollution. And uh, we review plans and we make recommendations. Sometimes we're listened to, other times we're not. We hope we're being uh, fair. Um, examples would include in the west of Hudson, the Bel Air project, which is a, a big ski development, uh, which was quite controversial. Uh, another would be the Wyndham Mountain Sporting Club, which is another development uh, in Wyndham. And a lot of the concerns west of Hudson have to do with the clay soils we have in that part of the watershed. What that means is when you have a big rainstorm west of Hudson, the soil particles are dislodged. Because they're clay, they're tiny, tiny little particles. They remain suspended in the water. And we can have, for weeks on end, turbid, brown, coffee-colored water which uh, can create problems with water quality and public health. Uh, also, it can impair other uses of the water, fishing, trout uh, fishing, and the like. East of Hudson, in this area, we have a different concern. It has to do with phosphorus. And that's because uh, these reservoirs, these lakes, uh, have too much phosphorus going into them. Uh, they have what are called nuisance algae blooms, uh, which you may see when you take a look at the reservoirs in growing months, in particular in the summer. And uh, that's because the various nutrients that contribute to the growth of algae are being uh, discharged into the lakes through feeding streams and wetlands in excessive quantities. Because of that, the State Department of Environmental Conservation has classified all of the reservoirs east of the Hudson River in the New York City system as violating water quality standards. Uh, and because of that, uh, DEC, with approval from the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, has issued what are called total maximum daily loads which are essentially putting these reservoirs and the activities that occur within their watersheds on a diet, <coughs> putting them on a diet, we've got to lower the level of phosphorus to reduce the algal blooms, which are impairing the quality of those waters. So uh, how do you do that? Well, in part, it's done by upgrading sewage treatment plants that discharge effluent within these watershed areas to the very highest level scientifically possible, and that's going on at New York City's expense. Part of it is uh, dealing with stormwater pollution. And stormwater pollution, unfortunately, is kind of a very difficult thing to get hold of because it involves natural activities. God makes it rain and makes the snow accumulate. It snows, the snow melts. Sometimes we get extreme water uh, weather events 
which can be devastating, as we, we saw with uh, hurricanes and uh, large tropical storms in the last couple of years. And so what you have to do is take the existing infrastructure and retrofit it, because that infrastructure was built before we even knew about something called stormwater pollution. And then as to new development, you have to make sure that when it is implemented and it goes in, that it's, it's being done in the right way. And so when we have uh, development projects, for example, we have uh, right now uh, the Algonquin Pipeline is a project by a company called Spectre. It involves uh, laying new natural gas transmission lines uh, through several states, including New York, and upgrading uh, and expanding compressor stations and meter regulating stations. Uh, so uh, there's a proceeding at the at FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and we intervened in that, and we've met with that developer to try and encourage them to take extra care in how they develop that project. Uh, Chappaqua Crossing, that's the old Reader's Digest site, which is being redeveloped. In Newcastle, a mixed use office space, retail, multi family. Uh, we're involved in commenting on that project. Union Place, Town of Carmel. Um, Carmel, I'm sorry. I got it right? Uh, that's another large mixed use development, and we submit comments on that. Then there's some uh, affordable housing developments. There was Bridal Side, uh, formerly known as Salem Hunt. Uh, we were heavily involved in that in North Salem. Uh, there are a couple of other projects that are either at the beginning stages or the middle, in the meadow in Somers, Commons at Curtis in North Salem. And uh, we get involved and we submit a lot of very boring comments, <laughs> very boring technical comments. And what are we concerned about? First, we are, we're concerned about compliance. Uh, compliance with the State Department of Environmental Conservation's general permit for stormwater discharges from construction activity. Uh, this is the primary regulatory vehicle for addressing erosion and sediment control during construction and uh, permanent stormwater practices that are built into the land as part of the development. Um, what are the issues that we typically see that we that concern us in these projects? First, uh, and, and this is a, a problem because for developers, you know, you guys don't want to spend a lot of upfront money, right? That you don't have to. On the other hand, on planning and stuff, I know you have, I mean, it, it can be overwhelming the demands of local planning boards and regulators. But on the other hand, from our point of view, when we're looking at the risks of water quality, we want to see very specific plans because we know that if the right plans aren't in place, that will make the difference between a project that would be benign for the environment and one that could contribute to an existing problem. So very often what we see in giving these comments in the state environmental quality review act process, we see often plans that aren't very specific. And we typically say we want to see specific ones. We want to see actual engineering drawings and designs. We want to see what how big your sediment basins are your level spreaders. Some of these things, I don't know what they are. I'm just a lawyer. But we have technical experts, and you guys hire technical experts, and they talk to each other, and we work together on these things. Secondly, uh, what we like to see, and what's called for by this permit, is uh, what's called low impact development, or better site design. In other words, is there a way that we can design these projects 
so that the stormwater infiltrates right where it reaches the land, rather than collecting it downstream in basins and dealing with it later. Because the more infiltration you have of stormwater, the less uh, stormwater volumes you'll have leaving the site. And that means the velocity of the water will be less. The volume of the water will be less. And that means you're going to have less downstream impacts, less erosion, less sedimentation, less denuding, uh, not denuding, but carrying away pollutants that are naturally on the ground or from human activity, finding themselves on the ground. So that's kind of uh, the idea of preventive medicine. Rather than collecting all the polluted water after it accumulates, let's see if we can prevent it from accumulating by infiltrating it into the ground. So examples would be to design a project with less impervious surface to begin with. Maybe uh, the roads can be narrower. Maybe the driveways can be smaller. Uh, maybe you can build up more and out more. Uh, that's always an issue, especially in commercial development. Um, we know there are countervailing interests uh, because uh, people may want uh, you know, sprawling homes, uh, especially at the high end, uh, residential. And uh, there are fire codes, and the fire trucks need to be able to get in, so the roads have to be wide enough. So all these issues have to be worked out. Uh, there's something called porous pavement, which is instead of having the asphalt, you have pavement where, which has pores or holes in it so that the water can percolate through rather than running off on a solid piece of uh, concrete or asphalt. So that's what's called better site design. Then the third area we're concerned about is just proper engineering standards for erosion sediment control and stormwater practices. And this is especially unfathomable to a lawyer. I deal with words, they deal with equations and uh, diagrams and engineering specs. But this also is very important because if you do have a, a stormwater basin to collect uh, runoff, uh, if it's not sized properly, it's not going to do a very good job. So things like that are very important. And especially in large projects, phasing is important. Meaning, instead of opening up the entire site or large portions of it at one time for a long period of time, work on a little piece at a time. That reduces the risk of a significant pollution incident during construction. On the other hand, must be acknowledged that it may be, from the bottom line, it may be cheaper to open it up larger areas. So there obviously are trade-offs in that. Then there's something called Chapter 10. Do you know about Chapter 10, Albert? Uh, you have the advantage of that. Okay. I know you read the first nine chapters, but Chapter 10 is an interesting one. Chapter 10 is part of the state stormwater manual, which must is an important uh, tool for compliance in this permit. And it deals with what are called enhanced phosphorus controls. And remember I said how phosphorus is the major issue here. Uh, so you got to comply with Chapter 10, which has additional requirements, how to reduce phosphorus. Um, then there's things like avoiding steep slopes. We all know uh, there are good reasons developers avoid construction on steep slopes anyway, because it's harder to do, it's more costly, and uh, there's a preference for flatter land. But as a county like Westchester is heavily developed, uh, it may not have so much uh, flat land left. And so the new development projects are often on steep slopes, which create an environmental hazard and avoid wetlands, adjacent areas, and the like, because wetlands perform a key function. Not only do they provide habitat for the critters that we love, but they act as sinks for pollutants, and they process pollution, and uh, you know, like in ancient Egypt, the reeds, uh,
slowly, are we adding to the load of phosphorus into these reservoirs? Even after we use all these uh, fancy techniques, and sometimes that may be the case. And what the Clean Water Act tells us is, well, uh, we can't do that. We can't take a polluted water body that's already violating water quality standards established under the Clean Water Act and contribute further harm to that. So what you have to do in that case, and we've asked developers to do that, we've worked uh, cooperatively with, with several, is to do an analysis to actually count how much they're putting in. And of course, these are estimates. These are gross uh, numbers. But they give a sense of whether this project is going to cause more problems to the reservoir, even after we take all these precautions. Yes, sir? Five minutes. Five minutes. That's good, because. Oh, OK. But yeah, we're, we're almost there. So um, we asked developers to do that kind of uh, accounting exercise. And then if, if there is a net increase in phosphorus because of the development, we say, well, that doesn't mean we can't develop because nothing we've ever said in any of our comments is stop a project. We've never said this project shouldn't go forward. What we say is then find ways to offset that increase. And that could be through projects, um, uh, retrofit projects where you have this existing older stock of uh, infrastructure, if you will, that really has no stormwater controls at all. And either uh, directly implement a project to reduce solutions in that infrastructure, or perhaps contribute to uh, municipalities, give them money so they can <laughs> develop that. And there's a, um, a, uh, a consortium uh, of Northern Westchester and Putnam, uh, East of Hudson, uh, what's called the East of Hudson Development Corporation, which is doing that. They're doing the retrofit projects. So we ask that they do that. So um, that's the basic playbook that we have. We like to get involved as early as possible. We like to meet informally with developers, and we're practical, you know, and see if we can work together to solve these problems. And uh, at this point, I'd like to take some questions. you're called upon, I feel like my wife's a teacher, I feel like a teacher. When you're called upon, when you're called upon, stand up, articulate, identify who you are and your question, and we'll take it from there. Hi, Carl Mullen. Uh, what are you doing with the fracking situation? I know that is a major situation here in basically in New York State. Uh, what are we doing about fracking? Uh, I can tell you what we've done uh, in this Watershed Inspector General Office. Uh, we submitted comments uh, as, well, let me back up a second. The State Department of Environmental Conservation, with assistance from the State Department of Health, is taking the lead in analyzing potential environmental impacts or health impacts from fracking, from high volume hydrofracking. Fracking has occurred before, but it's the horizontal drilling and high volumes involved that distinguish what's going on now from prior activities. Um, we uh, submitted comments in that secret process, and we recommend recommended that there be no fracking in the New York City watershed. And, yeah. uh, and then uh, DEC agreed, and so that is the state's position. Uh, you know, we, even though we're one state agency, we do participate in K 
hey, let's just as we bother these local planning board planning boards here, we uh, hit it with other state agencies. And that was the position we took, and we uh, uh, to stay free. So we were happy about that. Uh, we also have been involved with litigation in the Delaware River Basin because part of the New York City watershed is in that basin. And we made comments to something called the Delaware River Basin Commission, recommending that before they allow fracking, they do a full environmental review. And we also brought a lawsuit uh, against them because they were going to proceed to issue allowed fracking uh, without that environmental review. Yes. And the court dismissed the case not on the merits, but it said it was premature because the commission hadn't yet voted to decide to, to proceed. And so actually, the Delaware River Basin, and we're talking about areas in Pennsylvania, is the only part of Pennsylvania where that's in what's called the Marcella Shale, the area where hydrofracking is feasible, which is not yet doing it. Um, our office, though, has not taken a position against hydrofracking in general. The only position we've taken is it shouldn't be in the watershed, and that it should be done in a careful way if it's not at all. Um, I'm asking this in part for my friend Jane. Um, in communities or developments where we're on the board, it's Hillary Shepard. Um, do we, um, do you ever intervene or come between a developer who is trying to build on a watershed, aka the Hutchinson River, and that's this big now, um, along the parkway, um, in a situation where the city has deemed it and given the okay and started permitting this build, when in fact it's clearly on a watershed? So if we, can we wrap them out here? How's that work? <laughs> well, if you're talking about the Hutchinson River watershed, that's not in my valley. It's not that's Directly. It, it's not the New York City watershed. Uh, but, you know, my office is part of the New York Attorney General's Office of Environmental Protection Bureau. And that bureau uh, deals with all sorts of environmental problems. Uh, Watersheds on a small piece of it. When I say the watershed, I mean the New York City watershed. So uh, we have, uh, you know, we take complaints, we listen to people, people bring us cases or concerns. Sometimes we can accommodate them. Sometimes we say, you know, what you're saying makes sense, but you need to go and talk to this person. We try and help people. Uh, we can't like bring a lawsuit always, uh, and we don't get involved in everything. But if you have a particular concern, you can uh, I'll give you my card, and you can email me, and I will get to someone in our office who can take a look at it, yeah. whether it's me or someone else. A quick follow up on that, Mike. I must have, must have misunderstood. The Hutchinson goes into the East River, which is already or was kind of sewage. Um, which is right, you know, out around the New York City Peninsula, essentially. So I guess I'm thinking watershed, not just drinking water, but it's essentially your office deals with the reservoir and runoff that impacts the drinking water. Is that correct? We and do. not so much the river and the water around well, the city. Well, um, that's not part of the watershed inspector general's value, but our environmental protection bureau is very concerned about the Long Island Sound. And we've been involved in a lot of uh, litigation and other matters related to that. Uh, the Long Island Sound, we, I talked about phosphorus being a problem here uh, in lakes, in freshwater lakes. In the Long Island Sound, which is uh, salt water, nitrogen is the problem. And there's this diet. Remember, I said we're, we're putting the, the, the reservoirs on a diet. The Long Island Sound is a different kind of diet. It's a nitrogen, low nitrogen diet. So that's something we're very much involved with. So. That's nature. That, uh, it's a different spot. Uh, I'm Robert Weinberg, Robert Martin Company. <clears throat> uh, we have two kinds of developers, one family home developers, which would tend to be spread out 
and multifamily developers in which you're going to be concentrated, you indicated that you get into a project once it's proposed. Have you considered getting advanced of the projects and identifying areas where solutions are feasible and areas where solutions are unlikely so that the development community can be supportive and identify and go to projects that have possibility versus going to projects unknowingly that don't have possibility. You would save a lot of conflict. You would avoid problems with local communities that maybe don't understand what could be done, what can be done. The county is struggling with a monitor who's pressing counties to allow development, perhaps without consideration of the fact that you would oppose the development, and there does not seem to be a concerted and rational group of people trying to solve the problem. It's individual, you come in, you get hit on the head, you go away, you come back, and you curse a little bit and try another one. There could be better procedures which could originate in your office. Have you thought about that? I think these are interesting comments. Um, I think, from my point of view, the reason I'm here is to reach out to uh, the real estate development community to give a sense of what our concerns are. Um, we don't, as, as to individual homes, we don't get involved in that because we have limited resources. We tend to focus on larger developments because they tend to have a bigger impact, a potential impact. And with those developments, uh, you know, the developers, I think, that are true, sophisticated, knowledgeable, they get good consultants and they get folks that solve problems and avoid problems and they get good advice, they pay for it, it's well worth paying for it and they learn what is feasible and what's not feasible and so they kind of do their own uh, due diligence and uh, it's a way of you know, saving money and mitigating risk to the developer. And then by the time they, and then you have the town planning boards, which there are all sorts of concerns they have, which are very local concerns that we don't address. You know, it could be a traffic issue. It could be, you know, who knows why. And the developers who are uh, successful, I think, have their ears to the local concerns. Uh, they have the expertise from the consultants who understand the basic environmental principles. Is this on a steep slope? Are we going to fill? Do we propose filling wetlands? Uh, there are certain bells that start ringing, and oh, this is going to be. We're going to need a permit for this. So. I think when you get to the level of a larger development of the kind that we get involved with, we're dealing with pretty sophisticated people. You're, you're not getting my point. <clears throat> the point I'm trying to make is much larger. Individual developers like myself, we don't need that. We have those kinds of experts. I think it's community-wide, and it's government to government. It's not the developer. The developer is looking for development without problems. He will go where there is potential to get something done and not spend a decade or two trying to get it done. Your office could, with its expertise, its engineering, its knowledge, say, well, if the development can get its sewage treated reasonably to the Hudson, it's not in our, just as you said for the Hutchinson, it doesn't go in the watershed, Certain communities as entities much too big for individual developers to take on a whole community would say this community could solve the problem if enough developers came in, contributed money, and worked together with the local agency. If you don't take the trouble to identify them as the big picture, then the, what you think is the big picture is a little picture, and it doesn't get done. It gets deep in, spends a lot of money on consultants, finally figures out that it can't be done without a whole region, and it's all wasted money. Much better 
to get your office to say this community in general could solve its problem. There's money from New York City to help it solve its problem. The individual developer doesn't have to do it. And that community can either say, we accept or we reject. We would like the rate rules. We wouldn't like the rate rules. There could be a coherent conversation at a higher level, which would then attract intelligent development to the places that can support it and discourage it from going where you don't want it. You don't want to wait for a fight. You want to do it first. But somebody has got to lead, and the Builders Institute is trying. You can't do it on its own. It doesn't have that sophistication. Yeah, I think the points you make are good. I'm not sure my office is really the appropriate coordinator of that activity. There are others. Uh, there's Bill Harding in the Department of State who works a lot with the municipalities on uh, watershed water things. Um, that might be a good starting point for that. Uh, but it's not something we really have the expertise in. We, in general, our function is not to plan it. Our office is more uh, policy recommendations, enforcement, making sure the laws comply with. But uh, this is kind of, I, I think, something characteristic of the New York State government that when it comes to local land use decisions and planning, the state government, state agencies really generally don't take the lead. It's, it's a strong institutional and cultural artifact. Maybe it's not a good thing, a good but one. I don't, it, and I certainly see a value to what you're saying, but I'm not sure that the Attorney General's office would be the, the first choice for that role. I think Department of State, which plays that role, might be a better one. I'll try one more time, let everybody else speak then. I'm not suggesting you should get into planning and zoning. I'm suggesting you should get into expressing where the watershed can stand development or can stand development provide <coughs> certain things are done on a large basis, either in a sewage plant or in a pipeline to a sewage plant, something that requires government, rather than be an obstacle, <coughs> be a force for good to avoid the problems you're trying to avoid. And then developers will go where you're saying it is feasible and avoid where you say it's not feasible. You don't have to plan the development. They're perfectly capable of doing that. They just don't know where to go. And they can't afford consultancy at the state high level of the watershed. The watershed has got to kind of give it a little guidance to say, here are the places where the phosphorus is bad. Don't come near here because there's no solution. Here are the places where it can be handled. Come near here and we won't object to you. It's not land planning, it's watershed planning. There really is here. no place which is free of the phosphorus problem. Maybe that's where that might be a little bit of a misconception. It's the phosphorus, it, it, it all ends up in these reservoirs. And it ends up there from upland areas that turn into it. And that's the entire New York City watershed. And so that's really the problem. And the, uh, I think what you say makes a lot of sense, but I don't think we're very well equipped to do it. But I certainly see the value in some of you. Uh, Mike Goldani. Yeah, Mike Goldani, just a quick uh, follow-up, uh, Bill. Just going to piggyback what Bob said. I haven't really heard anybody talk about the, uh, the affordable housing stuff. Uh, the county's agreed to build or you know, create some of the affordable units. I think we're well on our way there. But uh, our association has been involved in a lot of studies that kind of speak to another upwards of 10,000 affordable units or 10,000 homes. Um, I'm not sure what your department's take is on that, but we want to at least just share that with you and let you guys know that there's an advocacy by HUD and some other federal groups, you know, kind of coming to Westchester to really push for these 10,000 homes. So, you know, we as builders are happy to do that, but, you know, there's sort of a conflict. you got the feds saying one thing, and then you've got, you know, local planning boards and, you know, DEP, DEC saying another thing. So, I really don't need an answer from you. just want to kind of give you some insight into what we're dealing with kind of really piggyback on you know, what Bob said, we need cooperation. It's not going to happen on a big scale unless there's cooperation with you know, government agencies and some real leadership. 
Yeah, I think um, obviously uh, that's a very important goal for affordable housing. We've got a, and I don't know the details, I just know how to read the newspaper that um, there is a court order, I believe, in a federal uh, housing discrimination lawsuit that the county is bound to. And minefield and 
and it just blows up in everybody's face. So yeah, I I, I understand the frustration, and if I were a developer, I'd be very frustrated. Um, and I, I guess what I'm really saying is, talking about the limits of my capabilities and of my office, I'm not dismissing the importance of what you're suggesting. We would be happy to participate in an effort like that, but I don't know that we're in a position really to take the leadership on it. We, we certainly would be happy to dialogue with you folks and uh, others you know, on, on this issue, uh, it, it's a difficult problem because you have to satisfy a lot of people, a lot of different people, and they all have their little jurisdictions. And it's a, it's a difficult issue, and it's hard to get any one entity which has limited authority to, you know, solve these problems. But I think the idea of dialoguing is a good one. We can. Getting all the, the people, I mean, and, as we said, that's how the MOA is, if you will, the Constitution that was drafted for the University of Washington. That's how it came about. Uh, various stakeholders were meeting and they, they uh, worked things out. So, I mean, we'd be happy to participate in that, but just can't claim that we are best qualified to take the leadership. By way of explanation, then we have uh, we I have three three questioners and we'll, we'll leave it at the three. Uh, the MOA, for those of you who don't know, Beltway speak. Uh, you know, I, actually, I think you're originally from Washington D.C. with all the different acronyms. Beltway. But MOA is simply the memorandum of agreement that goes back to 1997, as as, as uh, Philip mentioned. You heard me talk about it. And, and I, 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 I think he deserves. No, no. I, <laughs> I, 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 they know. They know it. Well, right, you were in your movie catalog. All right, 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 exactly. <laughs> All right, so we'll have Jean DeResta, then Jane Curtis, then Nat Parrish as the final question. Jean. Now, when you talk about phosphorus, you're talking about water detergent. This is your, this is the source of it. And ultimately, that comes from this, the way a house or buildings sewage is dispersed, because you don't have a conduit to send it to a treatment plant. So if you build in the watershed area, are there guidelines, for instance, for the management of wastes, as opposed to just simply identifying possible locations? I think what needs to be done is create an infrastructure, put that in place for the management of waste streams, because that's where your phosphorus is coming from, leach fields. Yes, uh, phosphorus is a variety of sources, including sewage, as you mentioned. Yeah, that's the primary source. Uh, that's a major source, but actually, the stormwater pollution is a, is a very large source as well. If a stormwater is going to happen, whether there's a building there or not. No, no that's not correct. I, I beg to differ. Um, the whole idea I talked about low impact development, it only becomes stormwater if it doesn't infiltrate. If it goes into the ground, that's stormwater that never was. That's why we are advocating and the state standards advocate for uh, what's called low impact development and better site design. Um, there are not only are there guidelines about wastewater treatment, there are detailed regulations, annoying detailed engineering requirements that uh, are found in New York City's watershed rules and regulations. They're found in the state health department regulations and guidelines. So the problem is not that there's a, uh, not enough guidance or regulation. They're all out there. Much, in fact, most of the sewage in uh, the uh, East of Hudson watershed is treated by wastewater treatment plants, which I have mentioned have already been upgraded to tertiary level of treatment, really clean. Uh, then you have areas where there are no wastewater treatment plants. They present a very difficult issue, and there are also regulations on that. In general, you can't, uh, uh, there is strict limits on building new septic systems in the New York City watershed. You really have to take the effluent and then discharge it underground. That also creates a difficulty with development, increased costs. So that's along the wastewater side. Then you have the stormwater side. 
the reason there's a lot of focus on so and by the way, when these development projects occur, they have to deal with both. They have to deal with the sewage, the wastewater, and the stormwater. And uh, a preferred solution for wastewater is the uh, question to convey that in a pipe to a municipal wastewater treatment plant. Sometimes that's not available, and then more creative solutions have to come into play. Unfortunately, this stuff is really detailed, technical, and uh, a developer has a tough road to home because you've got to satisfy the New York City DEP. You have to satisfy the local health department for the county. You have to satisfy the New York State DEC. You've got to satisfy WIG if we're involved. You don't have to produce the kids. We're not really a regular. Um, and then you have all of the local politics and requirements of the town and the town engineer. So it, it would be nice to have a more general framework that would simplify things, but the nature of development and regulation uh, in the modern regulated world, especially here in New York, is that it's, it's a, a sea of details. And that's why one reason it costs a lot of money is you've got to get good experts to get them involved. But by the same token, this, as uh, your compatriot at the next table, I forgot your name. Mr. Weinberg, it, it would be helpful to have a broader discussion with stakeholders participating to come up with general solutions or a process to find a way around all these details or through them. Two more questions, Jane Curtis and then Ed Patrick. Jane? Uh, Jane Curtis, my question also relates to phosphorus. I, you know, I first remember hearing about the phosphorus algae problem probably a couple of decades ago. And I just heard a very in interesting um, uh, discussion and information about, about the, the current problem and what's being done. But I can't help but wonder, is there not some potential technical solution on the horizon? Because it is a chemical problem. And other than eliminating the prolifer proliferation of people and detergent, you know, what, what are we going to do? The technical solution really is um when I talk when it comes to stormwater, it's uh, I talked about chapter ten. You know, there's a manual this thick about how to deal with these problems of stormwater, and they are technical uh, solutions. And there are always new um, mechanisms that are being invented, and the manual has to incorporate those. Uh, they involve all sorts of methods. Uh, this better site design, which is to infiltrate the water, because it, it does come from the soil. Phosphorus is in the soil, and that's why a big portion, I can't give you a percentage, but probably at this point, maybe half of it is from stormwater. Um, you have what's left that needs to be reduced. So it's a surfeit of technical engineering solutions. And it's like an architect designing a building. You know, if you uh, have two different architects uh, and the client goes to each, you'll get somewhat of a different building because there's professional judgment that has to be exercised. And that's how it is with these stormwater controls because there are many different ways to do it. Just like there are many ways to lay out a, a development site. And, uh, it's a science, it's an art. Uh, it needs to incorporate better technology constantly. Uh, that's something I think we can do better on. Uh, and uh, it's a difficult problem. And it's a difficult problem also with new development because you're talking about new sources. You know, if you start with a forest, there's very little phosphorus coming off the forest or metal. But when you create this impervious surface, things change quite a bit. So it's a challenge. And it takes creativity. And uh, by the way, a lot of these things cost less. You know, uh, so a lot of these stormwater controls don't add, in terms of construction, they may actually lower the bottom the cost and help the bottom line. Uh, of course, the engineering, 
has a uh, upfront, what do you call it, a uh, fixed cost. Uh, last uh, question, uh, Nat Parrish. Hi, uh, Nat Parrish, Parrish Alina. My comment relates to the policy functions of your uh, jurisdiction. I think you did a, a very excellent job, a wonderful job, of summarizing all of the concerns that go into your regulatory side. And you also did a very good job of summarizing all of the agencies that also have jurisdiction. And representatives of all those agencies could have come here and pretty much talked about the same concerns, certainly DEP, DEC, county health department, state health department, all of them shared the equal concerns. Now, from a developer's point of view, we're trying to work with them. Uh, the, what we're trying to look for in a policy way is how can we reduce the number and complexity of reviews to meet all of the objectives that you cited, nobody in the development world is going to have any issue at all with the objectives that you, that you cited, from A to Z. But the concerns are that DEP has a review, DEC has a review, your office comes in with a set of comments, uh, <clears throat> the permit process, once upon a time when CEQA was enacted, that was going to be one-stop shopping. That obviously hasn't happened. Now on a policy side, who is looking at how we can take these objectives and, and coordinate better, coordinate the review process which CEQA intended, so that you don't have to go to each agency and get a permit, each agency get a separate review. All right, you all get together and do a coordinated review and send it as one coordinated review rather than have people marching off different frames in time. You do a set of plans, send it off here to DEC, they say okay, then you go to DEP, they want to change it, then your office comes in validly with another idea. And as you say, architects can take different. But from a developer's point of view and the applicant's point of view and the objective which I think the state has is to further economic development, make uh, affordable housing possible, and at the same time protect the environment, that can happen with a more sophisticated, more sensitive review process. I, I think and on the policy side, some agency, or they can take the lead, certainly it hasn't been happening, in shrinking the number of permits, but still keeping the same purview. I, I think it's, it's a terrific comment. I think it's an excellent comment. Because some of my frustration because is, you know, when I see these processes taking too long, it doesn't serve the environmental purpose. It doesn't help the economy. So I think we have to come up with ways that are practical and more effective. What I find very effective, and what I would do if I were a developer, is I would round up all the cats. And I early in the process, I had a meeting, and I would try and get all those people in the same room, and I've seen this, and talk about the project, uh, what you want to do, uh, what your ideas are, and sound them out in a very informal way. And uh, Bill Walter did this with us uh, in the Salem month. And there were, there were not other agencies around the table, uh, but I'm sure he went and talked with the other agencies separately. It would be more efficient to do everyone at one time. I think it's, I think it's the best way to go, and the best person to do that is you, the developer, or to try and do it. I can't guarantee that everyone's going to show up. The meeting will show up, I can tell you that, uh, because a lot of it is overlapping, and the concerns are common, but it can also be a brainstorming session where um, some concerns that you might not anticipate, someone in the regulated world, regulatory community, I should say, has, has a concern. But how could you know they have a concern? So that's what I would recommend. 
Well, we're coming up on 9 o'clock, and this has been uh, a great program. And uh, uh, please give a, a warm thank you to...